Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to our last session for the day. Uh, I am Nancy Spector with the American Medical Association. I am a member of the Weedy Board. I'm actually the immediate past chair. So that means that if you have any questions or comments or anything about Weedy, you can go to Ed Hafner, who's our current chair. <laughs> Uh, so I'm happy to be uh, introducing our uh, panelists for our final session here, the Healthgate, Healthcare Standards Development Organizations Update. And we are starting with you. Okay, so we are starting with Bob Bowman, who is a principal um, with Interoperability and Standards at CAQH. And I'll turn it over to you. Good afternoon. Um, we do have an update. We have some slides. You'll see these on your Whova app. Um, but all of the content that is there, and we're always heavy on content, I want to focus on a few things to make sure you take those, away, those items away with you this afternoon. And part of that is that we do write the operating rules uh, for the industry. We look at the work that organizations like Weedy do, what they publish, how they work with their work groups, um, how they impact the industry. And we pick up on that. And then we also look at the organizations that develop standards like X12, like NCPDP, like NACHA, like HL7, and see where there are potential abrasion points between the implementation of the standard and what people really need um, for the data exchange components. So some of it is technology. Some of it is really, really deep in the technology components. Um, we heard NIST brought up earlier. We review what NIST does and what they publish and how they do things and what they recommend. Um, so we pulled lo lots of technical things along with the data that's foundational with the standards and see where those abrasion points are. So over the years, and we've been around since 2005, um, we have 10 rules that have been um, federally mandated. So there's a process. We'll walk through what that process is a little bit. Um, but that process allows us to... Um, as an industry, again, relying on the impetus from the industry where those abrasion points are, oh, sorry, um, where those abrasion points are to really highlight um, where we need to make little tweaks here and there between the standards, the technology, and what the um, providers really need. Um, so we work really hard to do that, and part of this is um, what we're here to kind of share this afternoon, basically that um, we've gone through this process again. It kind of, it's an iterative process. It loops over and over and over again for us because we constantly look at that environmental scanning where the abrasion points are with the industry and then identify, again, those areas, write the rules, and then go through a potentially regulatory process. Our participating organizations at CORE, um, they do this on a voluntary basis. So if you're a member of CORE, you will go and every year you'll go acquire those resources and implement these operating rules um, because it's the best thing to do for you as a health plan or the best thing for you to do as a vendor because you know it's going to bring that data and that technology to your clients. Um, but we also go through the regulatory process. So we'll write a letter to NCVHS. NCVHS will hold um, hearings. Um, NCVHS will write a letter of recommendation to HHS. HHS will then write a potential rule adopting um, the operating rules that CORE has published. So it's, again, the cyclical process. We're in the midst of this process now on a couple sets of operating rules. Um, as a quick way of update, we have some updated rules that we have published, as um, these include eligibility and benefits. So the 270, 271 transaction, if you uh, transact or conduct that transaction, there's new data that's being turned on within the transaction that would be required to be used. Because like many standards, the, ro the data set's really robust. So how can we make sure that um, health plans and providers and vendors and clearinghouses, um, they often don't implement all the potentiality. They only implement what's exactly required, right? So how can we turn on some of those levers to bring up some more of that data, make it available for providers to actually make it actionable? Um, again, a lot of this is to ensure that providers have the data that they need when they need it, um, because the health plans probably do have the data. 
it might not be where it should be today, right? It's not in the right database, it's in the back end, it's over here, but bringing up some of that data to the front end really allows providers to have access to the data when they need it. So we also have an updated connectivity rule. I talked about that technology component. We've updated the rule. We'll go into some detail on exactly what that looks like in a couple of minutes. Um, but we also have some new things going on too. Um, uh, related to our infrastructure. There's important components there too, especially for um, your trading partner community. You wanna make sure your system is up and available. You wanna make sure that there's acknowledgements. You wanna make sure there's different things that transactions don't get lost, either through the black hole that happens, through um, not perfect reporting back to the provider or the user of the system they get a dump code. How many people implement dump codes? Every health plan implements dump codes because they don't have the, the information, um, again, forward enough for the provider to make it really actionable. If you just get an er error code, oh yeah, it was rejected, but you don't know why, providers don't understand what they need to do to fix those rejections, make the changes to the input, and send it back out to get it processed. Um, again, some of these updates that we've made include our um, uh, system or weekly availability. Your system has to be up and running all the time. Um, there are quarterly availability requirements, though um, we know that systems and components are um, have moved to the cloud. There's much more complexity with um, how health plans and clearinghouses have architected their systems. So you might need more time when you make even small changes. You may have to put your system down for four hours on a Sunday night beginning at midnight, right? to 4 a.m. on Monday morning. Um, and so those types of uh, system outages and those ways that you have to migrate your systems and make those edits and revisions, uh, we accommodate those in the operating rules. So you can do those and still be in conformance and compliance with the operating rules. Um, again, I mentioned the connectivity. We'll go into more detail in just a moment. Um, here we have recommended some significant updates for the connectivity. Again, it is a safe harbor connectivity. It requires SOAP messaging. It has uh, stringent security authentication and authorization requirements. It's uniform and consistent. Um, there's lots of inconsistency across the industry when it comes to exactly um, how you should do this. And everyone has different recommendations. And every organization does it a little bit differently. And um, some organizations want to have a personal uh, trading partner agreement with just this type of organization, do it just this way. Well, then you have to go make that new proprietary implementation with another system or implementation or vendor do it a completely different way. Well, again, we're looking at NIST and what organizations, what best practices are across the entire industry and aligning on really uniformity and consistency. So it makes it a lot easier to plug and play with the entire network of training partners and community out there um, to make it easier and consistent, again, across the board. Um, something else that we have done, which is new too, is we've added RESTful standards within the uh, connectivity rule. So this allows for a more contemporary fire-based transactions to be used and embedded within our connectivity rule. So if you want to conduct transactions like a 278 using fire, it allows you to do that within the RESTful uh, enveloping standard over the public internet. So again, bringing uniformity and consistency across the entire network. Sorry, I talked with my hands. Um, so uh, it allows you to really use that um, method um, with anyone that you want to trade, to trade data with and say, hey, look, courses do it this way. And it's really uniform and consistent. It really makes it easier for us because now we can do um, reporting, auditing. Um, we talked about earlier uh, where you have to know exactly where there might be problems and holes in your systems and have analyses. and uh, Having that uniform and consistency really drives you to be able to do that better. More uniform, more consistency. You know where the errors are at. You know how to fix those, those types of assessments that need to take place. This type of technology, this type of um, uh, connection, these modes of transportation for the data really helps for that consistency to allow you to do that more easily, more simply. Um, I mentioned the eligibility uh, and the updates here. Uh, the top row um, in the gray is what you're already doing because these are HIPAA required uh, requirements um, between the standard and the operating rules. There's a whole nother set of requirements with this latest update. So you'll have to um, pull up your tiered benefits onto your eligibility uh, database so that you know exactly what this provider's tier is. They would know that in the response and know what the what that might mean for them when they look at this particular patient and what that might mean when they submit the claim. Um, you'll have to support additional STC codes. Those are the codes embedded within the transaction. 
Um, right now, it's only like 52 codes you have to support. Well, now you have to support an additional 126. That really brings a lot of um, visibility of what health plans have in their backend systems when it comes to uh, specific benefits for those specific types of services. So today, you might, I know we talked about dental periodontia. It might not be required to send, but it will be with this new set. So very, those types of segments that are really important for specialty providers, they're included in this set of STC codes. So instead of not being able to respond to those today because you send a dump code, which is a 30, that's what I call a, a dump code. Um, so if you just respond, you get a complex code that really specific benefits, but you as a health plan don't support it today. Well, the standard allows you to just send a 30 in response, a dump code. That doesn't really help that specialty provider. So with this new set of codes that you'll have to be required to support if this goes through, um, you'll be able to respond with that information that the provider needs for those specialty types of benefits. So again, really key components that really help the provider get the data when they need it. Other examples as well within the rule. Um, I do want to highlight some of the work that we've done in 2023. These are the new rules that we're publishing uh, or getting set to publish uh, later this year and into the first quarter. Um, we're looking at healthcare claims data content, uh, value-based payment, and EFT ERA enrollment. Um, we're always looking at core code combinations, and these are related to the CARCs and RARCs. Um, again, all topics that are really um, salient to this group, as we're looking at not only EDI, but also the entire revenue cycle. Um, some interesting topics that we'll also uh, talk about is the recent work that we'll have with NCPDP and the core of the uh, medication eligibility project. Um, it's really important for folks to understand what the scope is and how um, we're working together, which is really important with this type of organization like Weedy, is that we do collaborate, again, not only with the folks on the DS here, but also with folks that um, are implementing these things within their systems and getting that feedback so we understand this works here, it doesn't work here. So how can we ensure that, again, across the entire spectrum, we can pull the data together and say, yep, this works now. Now we can get this to work, um, not just in dental or just in medical, but also pharmacy benefits. Um, again, we have lots of potential rules coming out um, related to claims. The first is related to telehealth, a uh, place of service and modifier codes. Um, there's lots of discussion within the industry of how telemedicine could or should work and how it might not work really well for providers. They don't understand or they're constantly having to change. Um, one provider, I'm sorry, one health plan wants it this way, another health plan wants it this way. So you have to use two different codes, and then you have to use different modifiers. And as a billing agent or billing service or, or provider, you have to know which health plan wants it which way. So again, that lack of uniformity and consistency causes problems for providers. And if it causes problems for providers, it causes problems within their revenue cycle. So again, having that uniformity and consistency up front, knowing exactly how to do it, what that matrix should look like, and help health plans implement that so there's uniformity and consistency. Um, we also have, uh, the, I mentioned the error codes for the 277CA as an example of if a claim is rejected, you can't really send a dump code back to a provider and say, oh, your claim's rejected go figure it out, it doesn't work well with providers and it really slows down their revenue cycle processing. And then they have to have resources to do this on a manual basis. So pulling those codes and be putting together business scenarios and these specific business scenarios mean these certain pieces of data, is it provider related data, is it member related data, is it a service related data? These are the specific areas that you should look on your claim. We'll point out exactly this specific segment or loop or item within the transaction and say, this is where it's wrong. So they can actually correct this specific data element, resubmit, and kick the claim back to the revenue cycle. So there's some examples for what we're doing for data content for the claim. Um, lots of other things for VBP, lots uh, another big topic. Again, bringing a lot of uniformity and consistency to the data, uh, specifically related to um, use of the 834 transaction. So all the way back for those brokers, any brokers in the room, um, or health plans that are bringing new members into their products or services, understanding what that data is when they actually enroll with you, having that data available in your backend databases, and then making that data available for the provider, right? We're looking at the entire <laughs> revenue cycle from when you uh, get benefits as a member and 
January 1st is right around the corner. We're all going to go through open enrollment probably for 70% of us in the room. 29% um, is 6-1, right? And about 1% is 10-1. So there's lots of benefits. We're all going to be acquiring our benefits. And hopefully you'll see new fields when you enroll to put more of this demographic information about you um, so that your health plan can have that information so the providers can have access to it and then make better care for you. So those are the types of things that we're working with um, for, on the enrollment component. Um, uh, we mentioned EFTRA. We're making an update to our existing roles for the um, enrollment data for if you wish to enroll as a provider for EFT or ERA. Um, the original rule set was um, required under the ACA um, over 10 years ago. Uh, so it's been a decade. These data sets have not been touched. So we are um, breaking those open, seeing what the industry needs, especially with concerns for security and authentication and fraud and making sure that the data set has everything that health plans need to help prevent some of these things that we see, um, even with today's uh, presentation of uh, phishing and hacking. Uh, is there data that we can collect from a provider to help prevent some of this up front? And then actually have some policies around that data and how it should be used. Um, I mentioned that we are also uh, uh, going to be launching a joint eligibility role development with NCPDP. Um, this is related to those medical benefits that are, re are specific for pharmacy, but they're not on your pharmacy or your PDP plan or your uh, plan that the pharmacy usually has direct access to. This is on your medical policy. And so pharmacies and physicians have difficulty determining exactly where to go. Do I go here to my PBM or do I go here to the medical policy? So working jointly with NCPDP, we're coming up with those various business scenarios that these are the types of codes and these are the types of uh, pharmaceuticals and these are the types of therapies that are generally almost always, right? Again, uniform consistency is not that great across the industry for these types of codes that should be on the medical plan, and here's how you should do it, and here's where the code goes on the 270 inquiry, and here's what you should expect on the 271 response, so that um, providers, again, know where to go, and then get the actual data at the code level, so at the specific code level for pharmacy. So again, bringing those benefits, again, that hopefully the provider won't have to pick up the phone call, because that's what they're usually doing for these really complex benefits, but bringing that data to the front end so providers can have access to it in an automated way using a standard transaction. With that, I hand that over to Chuck. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Um, like to thank Weedy for inviting me. Uh, I've often heard that writing standards is like making sausage. You really don't want to see it done. So I'm not going to share any of the uh, unpleasantries of uh, standards writing. I'm not even going to share the uh, label that says the content of the sausage, because that's scary. Instead, I'll give some high-level recommendations of what you want to eat the sausage with. So let's give it a go. Uh, HL7 has been doing this for 40 years. One of the uh, remarkable things is in midstream, we changed how we uh, prefer to exchange data. And that reflects the birth of uh, FIRE. The key to our success has not been what we've done within uh, HL7 per se, but what we've done with our partners with whom we've collaborated. Um, by some estimates, there are about uh, 2,000 developers who actually want to write code. They're at the center of this spiral. But as we go out, the numbers increase exponentially. So there are uh, groups of perhaps uh, 100,000 uh, worldwide that are writing uh, implementation guides and other efforts of how to uh, enable it and there are millions of uh, clinicians, scientists, regulators, and so forth who are benefiting by the adoption of these uh, standards without ever knowing what they are. Uh, we have uh, partners around the world. 
with whom we collaborate, whether through the Fire Accelerator Program or affiliates. The Fire Accelerator Program has been one of the really instrumental vehicles uh, that have driven the success of uh, fire implementation. Remarkably, it's only six years old, and yet uh, the eight fire accelerators have uh, generated uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, adoption policies and implementations worldwide. Uh, in India, for example, there are uh, 280 million Indians who receive care uh, only mediated uh, through fire apps. The Argonaut Project uh, actually emerged uh, about a decade ago when Mickey Tripathi presented the uh, Jason Task Force report. Mickey actually became the first uh, uh, leader of a fire accelerator, and at some point he was actually uh, responsible for all the fire accelerators until he became the national coordinator two years ago. Some of the uh, uh, success of Argonaut is uh, things that we now take for granted, whether it's uh, bulk data or around clinical decision support, but now they're working on things like fire right, so patients can write back to the electronic health record, policy notwithstanding, and remarkably enough images uh, transported uh, via fire. Uh, the Da Vinci Project, which uh, all of you are familiar with, uh, was driven as a solution to uh, value-based care. Now it's grown to be a, a tremendous uh, uh, vehicle for uh, accelerating and implementing uh, many of the data uh, exchange requirements in healthcare and in research. Uh, this is just a, a visual display of some of the many uh, implementations uh, that Da Vinci has um, embraced. Uh, my favorite, of course, is uh, prior authorization. Thank you. Um, da Vinci has really done more than just uh, work on interoperability. I think it's fair to say that they've made some substantial changes around workflow interoperability. The Karen project, um, in a little different vein, is about exchanging data between providers uh, and uh, payers, chiefly uh, CMS, uh, Medicare and Medicaid, but also between other uh, providers. Codex is a remarkable one, near and dear to my heart, having been an oncologist for two and a half decades. Um, but they began as a cancer research project identifying data elements specifically for patient care and for research, now have grown to include uh, cardiology and genomic paradigm. Um, one of the uh, remarkable uh, capabilities is extracting genomic data from diverse databases in near real time and informing clinicians at the point of decision about the uh, genomic data that impacts their diagnosis and treatment of patients. Uh, medications work, I'm sorry to say, about half the time, but there are a lot of genetic indicators that would improve that, uh, whether you're uh, prescribing or receiving the medications. Codex has had a host of uh, successful projects and programs throughout its uh, short existence, uh, not the least of which is uh, partnering with the Vulcan, uh, the research fire accelerator, uh, to accelerate uh, real-world clinical trials by bringing the data from the clinical record directly to the uh, research record. Uh, Vulcan itself uh, was based not only on pharma and clinical regulated research, but um, the non-clinical varieties, the prospective studies, the public health uh, data that goes into our policies and decision making. Uh, Vulcan is supported by all members of the community, whether 
They are uh, healthcare providers, research, uh, universities, or uh, regulatory bodies worldwide. Uh, Ten days ago, the uh, White House Office of Science Technology Policy actually came out with a uh, announcement uh, congratulating Vulcan and Codex about their work for fostering uh, clinical trial capabilities. Uh, FAST began as an ONC uh, project to help build infrastructure for fire, and today they use the uh, resources with a host of the other fire accelerators uh, to provide infrastructure for exchanging healthcare data more efficiently, but also data between uh, healthcare and public health. You wouldn't be surprised to learn that the 3,000 public health agencies in the United States, half of them send uh, Excel spreadsheets by fax to the CDC, and we wonder why they're behind. Um, Gravity uh, began as a uh, modest effort to help identify social determinant of health data elements and has since grown uh, dramatically because of the adoption by some 1,400 agencies uh, and organizations uh, and actually link uh, the social determinants to uh, sites for a care delivery. Uh, Helios is the uh, public health uh, fire accelerator. Born uh, at the CDC, they came out with a remarkable project called Death on Fire. It's about real-time uh, enunciation of uh, public health data, so you don't have to create a report. It's simply abstracted from the clinical record. Part of their modernization uh, activities now born within HL7 as a fire accelerator. I think the most critical part is not the writing of the code, but all of the input that's generated in all of the communities that benefit by the standards development. So we collaborate with, of course, the SDOs here at the table to try and enhance the way uh, standards are developed, uh, implemented, and utilized, but also to retrieve feedback from the community about the larger capabilities and demands uh, that providers and researchers put on health data. Uh, Smart on Fire, a remarkable project that now serves as a basis for many fire apps, uh, was actually born at Boston Children's Hospital and now serves uh, uh, millions of end users worldwide to deliver apps at the point of care. I see a couple of smart developers in the audience. Uh, our uh, work with uh, NCPDP about uh, uh, utilizing fire for uh, pharmacy records, and through the research efforts of OMOP, uh, we began a uh, project um, to use OMOP on fire so that their data model and our uh, data abstraction are utilizable across the uh, paradigms of research and patient care. Um, also, virtually all of the uh, US regulators and numerous regulators worldwide uh, rely on fire. Uh, last week, I gave a presentation to the European Medicines Agency about uh, identifying pharmaceuticals uh, using uh, fire-based uh, data exchange. Uh, ONC has embraced uh, fire. And here's just a partial list of some of the requirements uh, for fire. I think perhaps uh, one of the most pivotal was the requirement that all certified electronic health records had to have fire endpoints by December of last year. We collaborate with uh, the professional society. So remarkably, through uh, extended efforts uh, by the HL7 leadership, CPT codes, which now generate 50% uh, 
of all the AMA revenue, let that sink in, are now freely, freely available when you test fire apps and use uh, CPT codes. Uh, the entire uh, panoply of CPT codes are freely available. Um, th at the end of the day, uh, these partnerships really survive because of the mutual benefit and understanding, whether it's the uh, trade organizations uh, with whom we partner, largely for education, but also their members provide feedback to HL7 about standards development. Um, virtually all of the EHR vendors and other members uh, bring their requirements not only for technical advancement, but for what their customers are saying. We need this. Uh, we need to overcome these hurdles. Uh, these obstacles are preventing care delivery, and they're incorporated into standards development and implementation guides. Um, twice Prime Minister of England, Benjamin Disraeli, famously said, there are three kinds of lies. There are lies, there are damn lies, and there are statistics. Any statisticians? Uh, okay. I knew there'd be one of you. Uh, we, we have a, a host of the consultant agencies that uh, contribute not only the, by implementing the HL7 standards, but by feeding back a continuous virtual cycle toward informing HL7 about the requirements that are needed. Uh, NGOs like uh, MITRE and CLASS, uh, charitable organizations like Pew and Robert Wood Johnson contribute to the knowledge base and the capabilities that ensure that the standards that are being uh, implemented uh, are the most uh, usable and uh, up to date. Um, five years ago, I was actually in Washington on the stage when the six cloud vendors got up and said, despite our proprietary demands, we're going to exchange data between us using fire endpoints. Not only that, uh, they have since agreed that uh, bulk data will come into uh, their clouds uh, using the fire bulk standard. Uh, we had a little foray into uh, AI uh, for the past two years. Uh, now with the emergence of generative AI, it's a, a new era and we've partnered with the Coalition for Health AI, made up of uh, uh, community leaders from the uh, private sector, academia, uh, industry, and the US government to help uh, support policies and uh, processes by which AI can be applied in uh, healthcare delivery. Uh, for us, they'll change uh, perhaps the way we do internal things and look forward to the day when we can say that AI has actually been a productive tool and notions about hallucination and false uh, AI output uh, can be managed. Um, at last, uh, I, I'd like to just highlight one of the issues that uh, we had raised already around security. So. Uh, not only do we partner with uh, ISO, uh, making truly interoperable and not just intraoperable, which uh, V2 had enabled with Insa Health Systems, but with uh, OAuth2 and OpenAI, uh, we can surely exchange data uh, on, on cloud services. Um, we have a new program where we've partnered with uh, DARPA uh, and uh, their uh, ARPA-H initiatives around uh, uh, increasing the security of uh, fire data exchange. And lastly, I'd like to recognize some of the key elements in making this possible, which is the enormous uh, contributions made by members like yourself. Um, the uh, one of my favorites is a, a smart digital insurance card. Uh, now we, we've embedded uh, eligibility requirements in a QR code, 
and uh, Sync for Social Needs, in which uh, merged as a White House initiative around food insecurity, and has since blossomed so that there are specific technical capabilities to exchange social need data with the provider at the point of care. So with that, let me say uh, thank you to all the people who've uh, made this possible, the uh, cloud vendors who are tremendous uh, supporters, the R5, which is the uh, future of HL7, is available now in a uh, draft format. Uh, R5 brings something uh, remarkable to the table, and that is what we call subscriptions. So no longer do you have to ping the server every time you want to update, but any uh, data element, a demographic, a laboratory result, image that you once access will be updated without you asking for it. Uh, so with that, there is a future for uh, R5, and it really is expressed in the kinds of things that we've had feedback from Weedy and other communities. Um, and these have been embedded in the uh, next release of FIRE. And as we speak, they're uh, talking about R6. So I want to thank my colleagues, Vat and Wynn, Dan Dreeman, and Diego Kaminker, without whom this could have been possible. So thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Margaret Weicker. I'm Vice President of Standards Development at NCPDP, which is the National Council for Prescription Drug Programs. NCPDP strategically continues to focus on the role and value of the pharmacist, patient safety, and access to care. Industry initiatives such as interoperability, health equity, and public health are aligned with NCPDP standards such as script, the telecommunication standard, the pharmacist e care plan, real time prior authorization, and prescription benefit check, as well as data exchange. NCPDP continues to modernize our transactions through the support of APIs. I'm happy to report that NCPDP member source API solutions are available to support current industry standards, including the NCPDP script standard, the real-time prescription benefit standard, the benefit integration standard, and specialized standard. With the future implementation of the telecommunication standard version F6, NCPDP will also be ready to support member source API as we move the telecom standard to a JSON um, syntax. Examples of APIs have been developed to support REST and SOAP protocols, allowing trading partners to meet where they are and use APIs to advance their business needs and potential product development. We have listed some of the use cases technical partner partners can take advantage of today to support the potential API needs. At our work group meeting last week, NCPDP formed a task group to develop NCPDP specific APIs. Uh, Chuck uh, touched on this briefly, but NCPDP's executive team is working with HL7's executive team to determine how to support uh, prioritization of current accelerators to support the development of use cases and in 2024, we'll be focusing on Codex, Da Vinci, Karen, and Vulcan. NCPDP continues to work with the HL7 Pharmacy Work Group. NCPDP strategically continues to review precision medicine workflow integrating NCPDP standards. NCPDP hosted a NCPDP webinar, and the link is on the screen. Um, last month to support how pharmacies and NCPDP standards can support in workflow integration. An update on the regulatory front. Um, NCPDP requested in 2018 
um, through in the DISMO and then through NCVHS to adopt the telecommunication standard version F2, the batch standard version 1.5, and the subrogation standard version 1.0. Uh, in 2020, in April of 2020, um, we requested an update to move to version F6 version instead of version F2. Um, and HHS sent a letter in April um, to the department. And NPRM was published on November 9th of 2022. The comment period closed of, in January 2023. Uh, 47 comments were received. Um, according to the current unified agenda date, the final rule is scheduled to be released in January 2024. We are hoping that that date will be met. Um, NCPDP has a SNP committee um, that is developing a transition guidance. Uh, yesterday, HHS released for public viewing the Medicare program contract year 2025 policy and technical changes to the Medicare Advantage Program, Medicare Prescription Drug Benefit Program, the Medicare Cost Plan Program, and programs for all-inclusive care for the elderly, health information technology standards, and implementation specification proposed rule. It will be officially published on November 15th. In the rule, um, they stated that NCPDP is withdrawing, CMS is withdrawing all proposals contained in the standards for electronic for prescribing sections that was in the December 2022 proposed rule. Um, NCPDP, as well as many industry stakeholders, um, requested in our comments to the original NPRM to adopt a new version of script as well as the RTPB standard, which is our real-time prescription benefit standard. Um, then later in the year, we asked for the update to the formulary and benefit standard. So in withdrawing the original proposals, um, this allows CMS to incorporate the feedback they received on the prior proposals seek comments or concerns about these particular standards, um, new proposals, reorganize, and then make technical changes to the electronic prescribing regulations, and allows the public to comment on all the um, prescribing-related proposals simultaneously versus um, in shifts. So that's the late breaking news. Um, NCPDP work groups, which um, where the bulk of our work gets done, are the place for all of the pharmacy service sector electronic trans standards for transmission, as well as guidance documents, white papers, best practices are approved. Um, the work groups meet quarterly. Uh, we currently support 11 work groups and we have 76 task groups, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, for nearly 40 years, NCPDP has led a transformation in the pharmacy services sector by creating and promoting standards for electronic healthcare transactions. Our collaborative consensus building process has produced operational efficiencies that save approximately $30 billion annually in healthcare costs by increasing the safety and quality of patient care. And more information um, is available on our website in regard to the purpose, scope, goals of each of these work groups. As mentioned previously, we have task groups. We have 76 task groups um, that meet between work group meetings. Um, they uh, are all done via conference calls. Anybody can participate in a work group meet, in a task group meeting. Uh, you do not have to be a member to participate in an NCPDP task group. Um, and we welcome all, especially those with subject matter expertise in areas um, that we are discussing. At the top of the slide, there's a link um, that lists all of our task groups. And then there's more information about how they function, et cetera, um, at our NCPDP university. 
the collaborative workspace um, is used by the task groups. That's where you will receive calendar invitations. You'll see when task groups are meeting. It's where we store our working documents as well as our call notes. Um, this requires a separate registration. Um, then if you were a member and go through that registration process. So this is a separate registration. Um, there's a direct link um, to that. Or if you are a member of NCPD, PD, the NCPDP um, and have signed on to that portal, then you can um, click on the collaborative workspace and go directly to there without signing on again. So I encourage all to join. Um, and we'll take questions afterwards. So I believe it's to Andrew. Thank you, Margaret. We good? All right, thank you. Um, first of all, to Weedy, the organization, for having us all here, as well as the Weedy members and, of course, the sponsors, because without that, we all wouldn't be able to be here in person with, you know, the snacks, the meals, and everything else. So thank you. So I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to try to be succinct here. Um, we're getting short on time. I want to leave some time for questions. For those of you that don't know, X12 is an a standards development organization. We have a handful of staff. We have a few hundred member companies and thousands of representatives that participate. Um, the members include corporation, government, um, government entities, associations, and individual members as well. They are uh, representing experts across various in industries. Unlike some of the other SDOs here, we do work across other industries, supply chain, transportation, finance, as well as healthcare and insurance. Um, we like to think our standards are the workhorse. It's not necessarily sexy, but it's a workhorse for business to business data exchange and are used billions of times a day by entities uh, across pretty much every industry. Um, millions of entities have already invested in the infrastructure to support the standards. We develop and maintain. Um, we think it's you know, tried and true, and these standards work today, uh, mostly behind the scenes. I'm going to leave a couple of updates on other things we have going on that I think most people looking around at some familiar faces are interested in um, what we're doing. We've got a proof of concept. So related to uh, the recommended new versions of X12's transactions that were in the process, some have been recommended and will be recommended um, for adoption. We've been, um, we worked with our licensing partners to create a proof of concept program. And we've got a few objectives here. First of all, verifying that the transactions, this new version, things work and they don't break things that are currently working pretty effectively um, with the current mandate, which is the 5010 version. We want to validate that the expected business benefits are realizable as much as we can. Identify obstacles. We do not want to hide behind the fact that everything may not be perfect. We've already identified some things that will require further clarification, which we're dealing with. Um, and I, again, identifying obstacles for people to implement and make that transition from the current version to a new version. While we're doing that, we're also trying to keep track of what is the estimated implementation cost. And it's a pretty difficult thing, as I think most of you would realize. From a software company's perspective, maybe a little bit easier to estimate what that implementation cost would be to transition from supporting one version to another. What that means from a trading partner, be it health can health plan or provider, a little bit more difficult because it's largely going to be dependent upon what the vendors, um, what the economics look like for them. And then we're going to, um, we've been trying to more consistently disseminate results, what we're finding, good or bad. And we're going to do that, I think, on a more predictable schedule moving forward. So for this proof of concept, we're looking at end-to-end -end workflow. Um, we're using real test scenarios. And then we're also using some synthetically generated test scenario with one of our licensing partners that specializes in doing that. Um, we've got there's six different types of testing, which are pretty familiar, I think, to most. Um, where we are today, we have developed test scenarios for all of the 837s, actually not just the professional, as well as the 835. 
one good, I think, um, thing we found about 95% of our test scenarios are very straightforward to implement and transition from the 50-10 to a new 80-20 or a newer version. Um, very, very easy to transition. Of course, there are some catches in, okay, what about that other 5% and how do we handle those? Um, example of one of the uh, challenges we were first faced with had to do with the, the claim ID that's included in the transaction. And the length that's allowable is different between the 5010 version and the 8020 and newer version. One of the good things, because one of the things we've been challenged with is, hey, if we move to this a new version, but we still have some 5010, the existing version transactions that are related, such as a claim status request and response, how can you do that with the new version when a claim may come in the 8020 or newer version? Um, it's been, a, we've, to, to date, we haven't been stumped. We have had some challenges. We do have some things we're gonna provide some further clarifications on what that transition will look like. But using that example, the 276, which is claim status request, can already handle an extended character length for claim ID that would be included with an 8020 um, claim. So next up in our proof of concept is focusing on what we call the RAS segment. Um, it replaces in the 5010 version what we call the CAS segment. It is, we think there's a lot of benefits to the industry. Um, for example, multiple claim adjustment reason codes um, can be included in RAS segments um, versus a single one that exists with 5010. We, that is next up on our hit list of we've got to build some complex scenarios to test this out, good and bad, and produce some results and make sure people know what to expect. Because already from the software vendors we've been working with, it's a big change for them to be able to handle it. Although we're pretty confident, and I think as one of our um, participants said on our last week's meeting is, the machines can handle it. Well, let, we, now we need to get down to the next layers. What does that look like from a business perspective? Okay, um, not, not a whole lot new. I think with the NCVHS recommendation that HHS not proceed with rulemaking at this time, it did slow things down. I think as we've previously stated, a lot of our proof of concept participants kind of put the brakes on things a little bit. We have continued to move forward. I would say participation may not be as great as it had been as far as the excitement initially for this proof of concept but we are continuing to make progress and we will be posting more results in the coming months. What else is happening in X12? Okay, advancing the version, of course we're continuing to meet with industry stakeholders to gather and address feedback we've already received from NCVHS and plan on what's the path forward. The second recommendation set is being reviewed and there's some discussions happening related to that and we expect to have the third set ready for formal recommendation in the near, I, I would not like to say a month, but it's probably gonna be a couple of months. Um, like my colleagues here at the table, we're continuing to expand our collaboration efforts with all of these organizations, including HL7. We've already worked with the Da Vinci Project. We're in discussions with some of the other um, similar initiatives. Um, obviously ongoing is CAQH Core, as well as the ADA. Um, and a lot of other, I think, industry associations. I think we all agree, and it's been a consistent message here, without the collaboration, then what are we doing here? As we all know, there's a lot of opportunities for improvement as far as data exchange and what's happening in this industry. And there is no one solution, but if we can all work together, I think we can do a much better job of covering them. Okay, as we're doing that, we're improving our tools. We're gonna be launching a new self-service portal for our licensing and membership in the coming months. Uh, a year ago, I may have said, I wasn't exactly sure when. I'm pretty confident it's gonna be in the next few months. We're doing some other things. Um, Jason was referenced a few times. We've already produced a lot of X, or actually all of X12 standards and implementation guides in an XML syntax. We're embarking upon a new in initiative to do the same with Jason. Um, we're also looking at who can we partner with to help accelerate that with some real life use cases that would be beneficial because these standards are already used. Well, and if we think of the X12 standards as this 
broad, vast vocabulary of metadata? How can we use it in different ways to solve different problems? And I think there's a lot of oppor opportunities there, collaborating with these other so associations. Uh, informational ed and education, we've got a new info center. If you go to our webpage, there'll be a link in the slides you'll get a copy of afterwards. And um, we'll continue to add more content there as it becomes available, make more information. We've got such a vast library of information that uh, we can just make available to help people, and that's one of our goals. Last up, just a plug, where our next standing meeting is in Sparks, Nevada in the new year, January 21st, 25th, on site. Registration will be open soon. Um, as many of you know, membership, being a member X12, there are no meeting fees. So please, if you're interested, please contact us in membership at x12.org. If you're not sure and you want to come to the meeting, please contact us. We can do a guest invitation if it's your first time to come to see what, what happens to sausage making. I think we said it's not always pretty, but the stuff does get done. Thank you. So I want to thank all of our panelists for going through all of that information. Great content, and it's a great understanding of uh, what the work is that you're doing and how it fits into the bigger picture of advancing our healthcare efficiency opportunities. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to open up to questions. Does anybody have questions for our panelists? I know it's the end of the day. Oh, they're good. You got it. I was going to say, I know it's the end of a, a, it's been a full day today, so. I couldn't let you guys off the hooks that easy. Uh, this is actually for Bob. Um, is there any uh, focus or um, initiative to since the phase one and phase two were the original uh, operating rules that are required by HIPAA, and there's been a lot of actors that, and plans and payers and various others that have even came into the industry afterwards, and there's a percentage that aren't in compliance. Uh, I think that's a well-known fact. Um, is there anything trying to enforce or get them into compliance? Because if they're always, if they're straggling on the basics, they probably are never going to enact and realize what the um, intent of even the new rules are? Yeah, I think it's a, a very fair question to ask the industry, and this is the industry here, right? Um, let me try to get this closer. That maybe I'll answer it a couple of different ways. One is that we do have a certification program. Again, it is completely voluntary. Most of the major health plans have completed that process, not only once, but also a second time for the recertification. Every two years, you have to recertify. We're, this is our third year. So every organization that has previously certified is go, has just about completed their recertification um, if they chose to do so. So that's one way for us as an organization to ensure that there is adoption of the operating rules. They're doing it the right way. Um, and you, as a user, as a vendor, um, a clearinghouse, as a providing or order organization, you can validate that they're really working through that certification process or recertification process. And um, we do have a complaint process on our own site. So if you are not getting the data that you need from your health plans or from your clearinghouses and they are certified on our website, but they're not actually meeting the requirements, you can file a complaint and then we will step in and work with them to mitigate that process. Um, because many of the operating roles, I mentioned 10 at the top of the hour, um, or an hour and a half ago, um, that 10 of them are federally mandated. So they also have become part of HIPAA. 
So you can also file a complaint through CMS, and then CMS can do their research and do their analysis and their due diligence to ensure that um, this is now a HIPAA complaint. There's HIPAA requirements to ensure that not only are you using the right standard, but you're also using the, the associated operating rules for those particular 10 sets of operating rules. So there's a couple of different ways, right? Those are a lot of sticks. Um, we like to think that the certification program that we have, voluntary process, is a carrot because, again, it allows you to show publicly, state um, your seal, that you are certified, that you are capable of sending the data according to what is required of you. And I know I might have skated around a little bit of that, um, but the carrot and stick process, uh, it's what we have, right? Um, so there's not every entity in this room is core certified. I mean, I'm looking around. I don't see everyone in here could raise their hand and say that they are core certified. Um, but they're all using the X12 standards for their eligibility transactions, for their claims, for the remittance advice. Um, so I would ask you as a, as a way maybe to show good faith, um, certification's a, an opportunity for you. I see Danny's got his hand up. While you're making your way over there, I'll, I have a question for Andrew, and I might be putting you on the spot. Yeah, this might be too technical, but um, you talked about uh, the um, the um, new 8020 version with the 837s and the 835 that were put forward for recommendation by NCVHS, and they hadn't recommended them. And one of the reasons they gave had to do with addressing ICD-11, the ability to accommodate ICD-11. And we, in the session, for those of you who were in the ICD-11 session earlier, uh, Jamie spoke about how um, we do need the standards to be able to accommodate ICD-11. Do you know kind of where that is, that, that activity in the, the X-12 timeline? Yeah. of changes? Not specifically. I'll say that my understanding is that it, in ICD-11 obviously potentially is a huge benefit to the industry. Um, I think we recognize that, and I believe we're ready, willing, and able to address it. I don't think it's been defined to the level that we would need it to include it in a new version. I believe, and I should look around the room, um, that we may have a maintenance request already submitted to support it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Stanley. What I don't know is that its level of specificity is going to meet ultimately. You know, because the RFI, from what I've heard, anyway, the RFI is still out there. So, without something more specific, can we build the mechanism and include it in a new version to support something that hasn't been fully defined yet? We can try. But recognize, and I think that goes back to one of the things we've changed in the last several years going to our annual release cycle, is that new versions of these guides will be published annually. So now, you know, how that works through the legislative process and all that, as we all know, is a little complicated. But it gives us, as a standards body, the opportunity to um, meet new requirements pretty darn quickly. Um, so I know that uh, isn't as probably clear an answer as you'd like, but that is m probably as much as I can say. Well, I think it's just good to know that it's on the radar screen, and, and I do agree with what you said about maybe not knowing exactly what needs to be accommodated size-wise, format-wise, but it's good to know that it's on the agenda. because. Hate to see sort of a chicken and the egg process in terms of what needs to be done there. So sorry I interrupted with Denny. Oh, <laughs> how did that happen? <laughs> so other questions then. We we um, need to have a question for Chuck and Margaret uh, to to round out our our panel here. The answer is yes and three. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have one. <laughs> That's it. If it's for me, I'm not answering. Let's. Yeah, and you know it is. Okay, so I have a question for Andrew. <clears throat> 
and I'm going to be nice. I promised I'd be nice to Pat. <laughs> so my question to you is, you know, in light of the NCVHS recommendation to not move forward with 80-20, and I think thinking through this being that I'm pretty much married to my 270-271 implementation guide as involved as I am at X12. There's a lot of people in this room that are not involved at X12. They're very heavily involved in other industries, but not X12. But yet they listen to the NCVHS testimonies at the subcommittee of standards and heard the news that it wasn't going to move forward. And I don't think that people realize what was included in 837s or the 835s to know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing that it doesn't move forward. Is there anything that the DISMOs or the standard setting organizations like X12 can do for those of us who are not participating in X12 so they can be familiar with those categories of change so they'll know whether or not it's a big blow and they need to get behind it somehow with like the letter that's on the X12 website to help recommend it or maybe it isn't a big blow yet because there needs to be more value adds added in future versions so we can kind of keep it so we're not just doing incremental itty bitty changes but we're also not doing the 200 large ones that are going to scare the bejesus out of people. Is there any way we could do something like that, like an education yeah, very, of some sort? Very eloquently put. Thank you. Um, I expect nothing less from Donna. Uh, Merrily, do you want to answer, or do you have another question? Uh, um, <laughs> I, I think you know what I think, and I think you've heard me say this in a different way. We're committed to communicating more effectively and consistently about what we're finding. Um, if you, you re reference the letter, X12's original recommendation letter, um, as well as the follow-up letter, as well as the high-level list of what we think the kind of bang for the buck benefits are, are all listed on the website. Um, and if you go to x12.org, um, you can actually just go to the search and put in NCVHS, and you're probably going to see links to them. Um, one of the things with proof of concept we're going to try to do is I'm going to say monthly updates publicly to say here's what we're finding, the good and the bad. Um, because what we, I don't think it would be almost an in-service to the members and the industry overall if we just say, hey, here's all the good stuff. Let's just, everything else is really easy, right? It's not true. We know that there's some complexities, but we know there's also, for the most part, those the complexities such as the RAS segment have potential huge benefit to the industry, the healthcare providers, um, it may make things a bit more difficult for payers, but providers' level of granularity for the information they should get in a remittance advice is pretty significant. So um, communication, I think, is the best answer, the best thing we can do, and not hide behind what we're finding, and are, we're committed to do that. Okay, so um, Andrew, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> One of the things that I thought, I think I remember from the, the communication that came out from NCVHS when they did not recommend moving forward was it was a concern about a mismatch among the transactions, but I thought it was also, I thought they also cited concerns amongst the public over moving just 835 and 837 while keeping other transactions behind and a desire amongst the, the, the industry to move the suite. I haven't heard that particular concern really addressed and I was wondering if you had any talking points around that and I'm sorry to put you on the spot because I know it wasn't in your but talking it's points. It's your job, right? It kind of no. is. Um, and I, I don't have, you know, I can't necessarily tell you the path forward. Here's what I know. Um, one of the past, I think, criticisms or opportunities f for improvement um, from NCVHS was incremental, right? How can we do things so this isn't every 10, 12 years big, broad, expensive changes? How can we make it more incremental? And I think X12 took that to heart. Thus, one of the reasons we have the annual release cycle which is, hey, we're going to have consistent releases every year, and every, it's, the schedule will not be driven by the scope. The 
The scope will be driven by the schedule. That's one thing. But going to your point, I think the incremental, the different series of recommendations was, I think, almost wholeheartedly a product of, hey, let's get, let's get the big bang for the buck um, versions or transactions, I'm sorry, uh, out there faster so that we can start realizing the benefit because there are, we believe, some very significant benefits to the industry in those, the claims and payments. So if we can get that out there and the industry can start getting some return on that investment to change, hey, that's good. And then we'll just start staggering the other ones after that. I know that's thrown a huge curveball in what we always thought how things were done. Right. And I'm not saying it's the only way to do it. Um, and as you know, one of our participants of the proof of concept um, last week said, you know, the reality is the full benefit um, of some of these things, you know, related to, you know, another controversial item, device identifier, isn't really achievable until we've got the whole suite of the new version. That's, and I, I believe that's the reality. So how do we manage that? How do we address the whole need for incrementalism as far as um, getting some benefit to the industry without having to rock everyone's world across the board is something that we're trying to address. Right, and I do want to clarify one thing. The purpose of my question wasn't to say, I think we need to do the suite. The purpose of my question was to say, I think it's something that we need to talk about the concern and kind of get behind the idea of, you know, what should we be talking about doing? You know, not, I, I, I actually see benefits in both ways. I just wanted to, just want to say a little plug for the Weedy Claims Workgroup. One of the things that we are working on um, is a survey of the industry regarding the costs and the benefits of the sort of list of the business changes that are in that, uh, what are the communications to NCVHS. And we're going to also use that survey to help educate folks about what some of those changes are. I think the, the problem that was related is that there are folks that are not following the, the, the updates to, to the X12 standard, and all they know is that there's a new version. They don't know why there's a version and, and what it might accomplish. So hopefully the survey will, will give us uh, two pieces of information, one, um, educating two purposes, one, educating the industry, and two, making sure that people understand the, the benefits and the cost, or at least get feedback on, on the things that will benefit them and how much they might cost. Thank you. Tony Sheath, Point of Care Partners. Margaret, I really wanted to ask you what a DERF is, but I think that would be an inside joke that not everyone would understand, so you don't have to answer that. But I can. <laughs> <laughs> of course you can. My question is this. So M Margaret had one slide that showed the collaboration between HL7 and NCPDP, which I think is really powerful, and I applaud you for that. As a CEO that's involved in multi-different standards development organizations and therefore spends you know, budget money to send my people to those, is there any um, thought or has there been any discussion about you guys potentially having meetings at the same time so that we don't have to go to Scottsdale one day and you know, Reno, Nevada the other day and, and, and whatnot. I mean, is there any, has there ever been any discussion about having meetings at the same time? Yes, there has been in the past. Oh, and there's an echo. Um, but the problem is you have people that want to participate in both. So which do they go to? Um, you know, X12, when you look at their schedule, their work groups meet, you know, Monday through Thursday. HL7, the same situation, full-blown Monday through Thursday. NCPDP typically meets Wednesday through Friday. So it becomes why you may all be in one city, so to speak. It becomes uh, where do you send your people and looking at agendas. And maybe you do run over to X12 for an 837 and then run over to HL7 for something, then come back to NCPDP. Um, but 
the benefits would be you'd all, you'd be in the same city. You might have to send the same number of people, but you would be in the same city. And in fact, we did that one time with HL7 way back in the day um, in San Francisco. And basically, you know, there there wasn't a lot of activity that was associated with pharmacy at HL7 at that time. So there wasn't a lot of cross collaboration and attendance. We do try to coordinate our meeting schedules so we don't overlap, but sometimes that can't be helped either. Um, quickly, before we move off of Margaret, I just want to draw attention, and I think everybody needs to appreciate the level of acrobatics that NCPDP and your standards are going through in the uh, regulatory <laughs> process, the way you were describing that, I don't, you must have like a flow diagram on your wall or something to keep track of all of that. And very impressive. <laughs> Thanks, Nancy. Very frustrating that I have to do it though. So this isn't really a question for Andrew. <laughs> It really isn't. It's more about a response to what Mary Lee said and what Stanley said. So one thing about what Mary Lee, you had said about the suite and how nobody's addressed it. It's, is it possible? And it's really not a question for you. It might be one for, say, the NCBHS folks um, for the standards on sub, the subcommittee on standards, which is if X12 doesn't address moving it forward as a suite, couldn't NCBHS hold it and say, okay, yeah, we're going to promote and recommend 80, 28, 37, but we're not going to do that until the 276 gets here, the 278 gets here, the 270, 271, and then they say we're going to push it together, and it's not up to X12 at that point. It's possible. Again, I don't expect anyone to answer. Um, right. Um, and we're not all looking at Tammy. And then um, the other thing, what Stanley mentioned about your basically putting together your value proposition. That's exactly what I was talking about when I asked Andrew. Like coming up with the list and not waiting till the pilots and the proof of concepts that are basically transaction by transaction, but having each of those X12 work groups sit down and all come up with a single template with their value proposition of, of what they're putting in those future versions. So everyone else who's not participating in X12 will be able to see this like here's the ten top ten things that kept work group one at night up, and these are the ten things they've conceptually fixed and or addressed. So the the industry knows what's to come. So when it gets to NCVHS, they have an idea of what is actually being proposed. And then the flip side to that is when it comes to some of these transactions, we know there some of them are high powered, some of them aren't. So I think it's going to behoove us to concentrate on the bigger ones, like the 837 and the 270, 271. Um, and, you know, I know there's a lot of hubbub alub out there about the 278, but maybe we just say, okay, let's wait on the 278 and focus on the ones that are highly utilized today. And then when that time comes, we'll talk about the 278 and the 834 later. Not that I don't love them. Last call. I think just all good things, Donna, in terms of we as an yes, industry, Samantha the collective is. we needs to be thinking Everything's about. Everything's okay. So I think that's it, uh, Nancy. Okay, nothing in the chat? No. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. This has been a really interactive, exciting, <laughs> informative <laughs> discussion. And hopefully all of you are sticking around for our reception that will be starting up in a matter of just a few minutes. <laughs>